Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Fish Lake Bible Church on this snowy morning. We're glad that you made it here safely and get to join us in worshiping our Lord and Savior this morning. Please stand with us as we begin this morning and singing together our song of the month, Holy Forever.
<laughs> uh, he's just Pastor Matt's trying something new. Uh, good morning. How are we? <laughs> Thanks for being honest. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we are so grateful we get to gather here this morning. We're thankful for terrible weather. Uh, we are thankful for your safety. We're ter uh, thankful for your provision. God, and we are thankful for this season because it was ordained by your hand. And so, Lord, we look to you. We praise you. We bring you uh, great joy and triumph that you are the King of kings and you have overcome death itself. And so we rest in that this morning. We look to you and pray that you'd continue to fill our hearts with joy and hope in your name. Amen. Oh, please stay uh, standing. I only have one quick announcement, and then we'll greet each other. If you want to continue to put this in front of you, our Valentine's banquet is on February 17th. It's for 55 years old and up. Uh, our Olympians and Gophers are hosting this. Great opportunity for them to serve. Great opportunity for y'all to enjoy a nice dinner uh, with your loved ones and with the people of this church. Okay, so please RSVP. You can do that online using the QR code, or we have physical signups out in the foyer. That's uh, the only thing I have. Welcome to Fish Lake. Turn and greet one another. As you find your seats, I'm going to ask that you remain standing. Please stand up and, if you're able and join us in singing together, We Believe.
Continue to sing to our Savior this morning. What a, what a beautiful name. Now is the time of our worship service where men will come and we take up an offering, say it every week, continue to say it every week. This is not the time where we ask you for your money. This is just an extension of our worship and giving back to the Lord as he has given to us. And so as the Lord leads, would you give in worship? Pray with me this morning. Father, what a beautiful name you have. Jesus, our Savior, there is no rival. You have no equal. There is no one who can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with our God. 
you have leveled the playing field. Your blood is sufficient for every single person in this room, regardless of their past and regardless of their future. That is how powerful you are. So Lord, we praise you that you are a God, not only who saw us in our need, but you met our need, and our need was you. So you gave us yourself, and we praise you that you gave us yourself. Father, would we be a people who worship you and who give of ourselves as equally as our Savior did in all areas of our life. In your name, amen. Thank you, Ava. Let's stand together, continue singing, and worship to our Savior. Let's stand together and sing No Other Name.
time we have special music. We try not to do this, but it's special music by us, in part because you probably get a little tired of hearing us at some point, and also because our voices can only go so far, but man, what a song to sing, and what a great Sunday. Listen, someday we get to stand around the throne, I'm going to cry, and stand together and sing and glorify God for eternity, and that is a day I look forward to. And we can look back on our testimony and know that God has been faithful. Man, he's good to us. Now I have to drink some water. Then we'll start. Dark, 
But options are few When I can't see what you're doing I know that you're proving You're the God who comes through Oh, but I know That over the years I look back on this moment I see your hand on it and know you were here and not Thank you, Hagen Botham's bus, Pastor Malin. Uh, you got me going uh, a little bit. Um, you're singing about my God. Were they singing about your God? He is good. And it's only taken me uh, just till right about now to realize the ministry of pain and trials that we all do. And sometimes we bring it upon ourselves. What I mean by that is, about a month ago, I remember having a real 
heart to heart with God and I asked him, pleaded with him, Lord, make me more dependent on you. Help me trust in your strength more. Help me be less Tim and more you. If you, uh, if you do know, I am recovering from a severe back injury to where I've been humbled the past couple weeks in various ways. And let me tell you, there's a better view than laying on my back and just seeing the ceiling when I can stand here today and look out and see all of you. God is good. I am thankful to be standing upright. I have been humbled multiple times. Merv Miller shook my hand and said, how's your back? If you know Merv, and then the surgeries, 80-something surgeries that he's been through and the testimony that he has through pain, to ask me how my back is, that's humbling. To have Pastor Matt and Tanner Hunt visit me in the hospital and unbeknownst to me, shuffle right behind me like this, like they're doing a conga line dance, mocking me in my pain. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for friends that can laugh during pain. I want to encourage you this morning. Everybody here is going through something. I believe everybody here has said that dangerous prayer and that wanting prayer, Lord, help me lean into you more. I need more of you. And they've asked questions. Lord, why am I going through this? What purpose is this? Why me? And all those prayers of just to get through today. Lord, help me get through this thing. Lord, help me take literally the next step. You're here right now. You've made it. You've made it through the hardest days that you've had thus far, and God is the one that brought you through it. You are undefeated. I know people make a big deal about the Michigan Wolverines being undefeated this season, but you are undefeated, and every single day you say, Lord, just let me get through today. Because he is faithful. Because he is undefeated. Because he is the redeemer. You are the redeemed. You're here today for a reason. Your pain is for a reason. Your questions are for a reason. Today we're going to look at a group, two groups, in Luke chapter 9. Two groups that were perplexed. One of them had the right response. And when they were perplexed, they trusted the Father. They trusted the Son. They trusted Him no matter what came their way. The other group, however, specifically King Herod, as we're in Luke chapter 9, sought out answers to his questions. And when he didn't get what when he, when he didn't get what he wanted out of God in the Son Jesus Christ, ah, be away with you. This man's a madman. What group do you belong to? The group that says, I don't know how this makes sense right now, Lord, but I know that everything doesn't have to make sense to me because your ways are higher than my ways. And the only thing that I need to know is that you are faithful and I can trust you no matter what happens. Or the other group that says, yeah, I'll trust you if you do this for me. Give me a little song and dance, Jesus. I want you to make this happen and then I'll believe you. Faith comes by hearing. Blessed is he who has not seen and still believes. The disciples heard a command. Herod, when talking to Christ, heard nothing because Christ knew the questions in his heart before he even asked them. What group do you belong today? When we're perplexed, what do we lean on to help us understand what we're going through? Nothing can bring that out of you more than pain. But he is faithful. 
He is good, and the testimony belongs to him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I am so thankful to be gripping the sides of this pulpit this morning. I am so thankful for your grace. I'm thankful for this family. I am thankful for your testimony. All of this is for you. The songs are for you. This building is for you. This sermon is yours. Please give us all ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to know, and no matter the trial. The hindsight bias is this. You are faithful, and look what you've brought us through already. You brought us all the way up to the point of the cross and through it in your Son, Jesus Christ. He made it through that perfectly. May we focus on him to get through the day to day, and you get all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Pain also has a way of distracting you. Uh, case in point, I don't have a PowerPoint today. Eh. So, of all the things I was worried about, technology was not one of them. So we are in Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. Did I even say grace and peace? I didn't? Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm out of practice. We're going to read through the text, and we're going to go back through, and then we're going to get right in it. Now, uh... I have been waiting three weeks to preach this, so apologies in advance if some of this seems like abrupt. The truth is abrupt. I'm here to preach. Preaching's different than teaching. Preaching is logic on fire, and preaching is trying to promote y'all and myself to move with the truth. So, I'm a little edgy. Just warning you. Chapter 9, starting verse 1. And he, Jesus Christ, called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey. No staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money. And do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there, depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed. Because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, that being John the Baptist. And by some that Elijah had appeared. And by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. Herod said, John, I beheaded. Well, who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. Perplexed. Perplexed means to be at a utter Loss of understanding. Not to be confused with confused. There's a difference. Word nerd, there's a difference. Perplexed. I am utterly perplexed at why, or how, rather, we can, as humans, compile a machine with a lot of fire and get to the moon. I'm at utter loss. Ask me how we did that. I cannot explain to you how that happens. I cannot explain to you what NASA does. I don't, I have nothing. Confused is, I don't know why my son hates pizza. Okay? Difference, at an utter loss. Have you ever been at an utter loss for an explanation regarding an event or circumstance in your life? One may relate to this. After looking at their spouse and wondering, what have I done to be blessed as I am? Or rather, what have they done to deserve someone like me? I'll let you figure out that on your own. Perhaps an unexplainable circumstance of someone meeting a need anonymously. I love the ministry of remaining anonymous, and it also drives me nuts, because I want to know who to thank. 
Or even when your child does something outlandish that you wonder, what in the world would ever make you think that and do that? What is wrong with you? What was going through your head? Perplexing loss of words, inability to understand, can range from the simple, why did you just do that, child, to the heavy and complex. Why is God letting this happen? Why is God not stopping this? Why me? In the text today, the two groups we're talking about, ones whom I believe have been perplexed, but trusting and entrusting God use them to change the world. How large the world is. Versus the one who didn't understand, and though he was met with the truth, he met Jesus Christ face to face. And King Herod, something as small as the heart, wasn't changed a bit. Christ didn't give him the answers he wanted. I am thankful that we're even allowed and asked by God to ask him. Seek and you will find. But we need to prepare our hearts and minds before we come to the throne and ask him for something. Remember what I opened with? Lord, help me rely on your strength. Well, here I am. God is faithful. He answered that prayer. He knows what's already in your heart before you're going to ask it, and he knows what you're already going to need because he's all you're going to need, and he knows himself. Humanity is obsessed with prove it. No video never happened. Prove it. Because we are the center of our own universe. King Herod is going to seek and find Jesus Christ and he's going to tell Jesus to prove it. Say something godly. Do a miracle. Make this happen. Prove to me that you're exactly who you say you are, and I will consider whether or not I want to follow you, if it's in my best interest. Oh, heart of man, how wicked and deceitful. Kings and queens of our own personal kingdoms, that is what we are. For how often do you hear, why doesn't God just show himself to everyone and prove it to me that he exists, and I would believe in him? Faith comes by... Hearing, and hearing by Facebook. (laughs) The word of God. He has already said it. He's already proved himself to you. If you you were God, if you were God, what would be the best way to show yourself to all of humanity? Individually? One by one? As soon as a child is born and comes of age and can understand, then God comes down and meets him one-on-one with everybody at all times. That seems like a constant cycle. Or better yet, how about God just come down here right now? Praise the Lord for some. He is here. Holy Spirit resides in us. How would you do it? How about picking a specific, precise, foreordained point in history where he is going to send himself in the human form and he is going to have every single historical account that points to him points to exactly who he says he is, and he's going to have witnesses. When there's two or more witnesses, then it is validated. And he's got all of these witnesses, all of the gospels, all of the truth, right here in front of these people. We have got to get beyond, prove it to me now, because he proved it to us then. He has displayed himself in fullness. Fullness of God in creation, fullness in God in his word. Faith comes by hearing, or are we too busy still being caught up Like doubting Thomas. I'll believe it when I see it. Don't wait to that point. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior and you're still pointing to him and blaming him for things of a sin fallen world, you're blaming him and you're saying, I'll believe him when I see him. When you see him and you're before the throne, it's too late. Don't wait till then because he will prove himself. You ask him that question. Do not wait to that point. The disciples that were with the Christ, they did see him. They did hear him. And they wrote down what he said, what he did. So that we can have the evidence. 
so that when we are perplexed, we're at a loss of words. He's not. Seek him and you will find him. Seek the answers in his word. He has already explained what we are to do. He has already explained to the disciples what they are to do. And it would be very perplexing to me if we're going ready to get on a missions trip, which we're going to, Camp Kaskatawa, see Pastor Matt. But we're not going to take anything. Don't take any money. Don't take your wallets. Good luck getting through the airport without any wallets. Don't take anything. Just your clothes you're wearing. Now, my kids already do that on trips, especially my son. He's just like, I can wear the same thing for a week and a half, just like you, Dad. Okay. Nothing. I would be at a loss of words. Well, how are we going to be provided for? Christ is going to provide for them. Christ is going to be in everything he told them not to bring. He is going to be in the houses that welcome them in. He is going to be in those people's hospitality that open up their doors. And he's also going to be in the houses in which they're not hospitable. Here's a difficult truth. God works with good things. God works with bad things because God works all things out for his glory. Why would he tell them what to do when they're not going to be welcomed in a house if he didn't know it was going to happen? He can use that too. And use it as a what? Use it as a testimony. He even uses the, as from our human perspective, the bad things for his good. It doesn't take our understanding of specifics to know that our Father is working. And many times when I was a kid, I'd be home. Where's Dad? He's at work. Okay, where exactly is he, though? Like, I know, I know my, dad, my dad ran a, 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 a trash route. He's a garbage man. It's a fantastic job, by the way. We get all sorts. Anyway, um, and I don't need to know what route he's on. I don't need to know uh, how much gas he has in his tank. I don't need to know the specifics of what he's doing. I know he's working. And I know he'll be back. I know he's providing. Even my father. Some of you guys know my testimony. I love my father. I didn't have the greatest childhood. But he was out in that truck providing he was working. I didn't have to question whether or not my father's working. You know your father's working on this day right now for you and your best interest, and that best interest is him. He's still working through everything you're going through. He's still working. Now, to the text to break it down. And he called. Stop right there. He called. Jesus calls. Jesus calls. Jesus knows. Jesus answers. Jesus fulfills. Jesus prepares. Jesus equips. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. I therefore a prisoner for the Lord. Yes, he was writing from a prison. Urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. He has called you. He will equip you. He is going to emphasize right here in this text what they are not to bring because he is those very things. Don't bring a staff because I don't want you to lean and rest on anything else other than Jesus Christ. He is faithful to carry you through whatever you're going through. He's faithful to the ones he calls his own. These are his guys. These are the ones that he's going to use to change the world. He is faithful. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Power is the ability to carry out the command. And authority is the right to be able to carry out the command. He gave them both the power and the ability to do 
what they're called to do. The authority, the right to do what they are to do. And it was an evidence. It was a prove it to the people around them. That they were of Jesus Christ, and this is his power. Because they had a mission. One of the first missions was, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ came to this earth. His mission, proclaim the kingdom of God. And to save the sinner. He was proclaiming, he was teaching, he was preaching the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. The healing here for these disciples. I believe in healing. I believe that the uh, New Testament sign gifts of healing, I believe that they have ceased in as much were not to put God in a box, but they were used as evidences for these twelve, that they were apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is who he was going to build his church on, and they were to be proven out to be authentic. How do you know a false teacher, a false apostle, if you don't know which ones are authentic? Verse 3, And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. Double tape here. No staff, no staff to lean on when they were tired, no staff to protect them from attack on the road. Staffs have more than one purpose. God in Christ Jesus, through the power and authority of the Holy Spirit, is who they would lean on when they tired. God is their protection with eternity in view. Christ is our rest. I have been told countless times these past couple weeks Pastor Stover, make sure you... Why are you laughing? Rest. Anyone in here struggle with rest? I want to be strong. I didn't want my kids to look out the window and see me passed out from medication when the, when the ambulance was pulling me out, I didn't want my kids to see me when I was weak. They knocked me out, asked my wife. I was woo-hoo, gone. I didn't want my kids to see me like that. Why? Because their daddy's strong. I don't want them to see me weak. What I just said was the real weakness. When Christ is your strength, it's okay for people to see your weaknesses. You don't don't identify with your weaknesses. You identify with his strength. Lean on him. It has been said by the world countless times, oh, you Christians just use Jesus as a crutch. Break my legs then. Because I don't want to lean on anything else. And I say that hesitantly, Lord. (laughs) Whew. Whew. He's good. No bag. This is a beggar's bag. This is a alms bag bag. You're not going to need it. These disciples are not going to need it. They're going to be provided for. You are going to be taken care of. You might not be staying at the Ritz, but you're going to have a roof over your head. Because thinking about this, lying on my back, he's telling the apostles this, that they're going to be people that welcome in their home. Well, go over here. God has been working in these homes with these people. What are theirs? What's their story? Don't need to know all the finite details. Their story is the same thing as the disciples' story. Jesus Christ is exactly who he says he is. And we're called to be hospitable, loving. A stranger comes and knocks on our door. We hope and we take care of him. Don't need to know everything. You don't need to understand everything. You just need to understand the one thing. God's always working. And he worked out the greatest necessity for your life. When before the foundations of the earth, he had a plan. He had a plan to rescue you, to redeem you, to build you up, to bring you home. It's all him. You don't need to beg. You don't need to beg. Beg is a sign of repetition, a continual begging just ask him. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. 
Just ask Him. You seek Him at one time. If you don't know Him this morning, ask Him. I want to know you. I want to trust more in you. I want to seek you. If you've been a Christian for a long time, but it seems like you're kind of bogged down in your study and your worship and your prayer life, ask Him. Lord, rekindle that in me. Bring it back. Build it up. Because He is the provider. Nor bread. The Lord will provide your substance, your sustenance, in full through the hospitality of others. Hospitality in this world doesn't make any sense without God. Let me explain. Let me explain. The world belief of dog eat dog, I got to be on the top shelf, survival of the fittest. Why then would you share your food? Why then would you share your home? Why would you give to anybody if the mentality is, I'm for me. Hospitality doesn't make any sense without God. Christians are supposed to be hospitable. What's mine is yours because what's all of ours is his. We're just borrowing it. We borrow this building because Christ is going to redeem it. We borrow our spouses. They were a gift from the Lord. They belong to him. We borrow time. Mm. It all belongs to him. Your provision, your bread, the living word. He is your provider. Again, you don't have to understand how everything is going to work out. There is in psychology uh, called hindsight bias to where, oh, if I would have known that, I would have done this different. Kind of like, well, if the refs were going to give the Lions such a hard time without this lineman checking in, uh, they would have made it more adamant, so on and so forth. If the, uh, why didn't they just give the rings to the eagle on the way to Mordor, so on and so forth. Some of you may get that reference. Hindsight bias is, if I would have only known, then I would have done something different. Hindsight bias for a Christian. What do you know? You know that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for your penalty of sin, and he paid out the full wrath of God that you deserved and you're not going to taste that anymore since I know that that's all I need to know right now why is my lower back in shambles why do I celebrate as a 35 year old that I took a couple steps Brooke Hunt told me that their son uh, took a couple steps and she was all excited and she told me before my wife, so that's a little gloating point. Uh, and I said, oh, he took a couple se- steps today, so did I. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Why? 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 Be still. Know that I am God. Know that he is working. The only thing that I have to understand right now is that God is faithful. And I'll be able to look back at his testimony and understand that he's been my provision. He's been my bread. He has been my everything. Nor money. Still God meeting the needs of his own through the growing body of believers. Nor two tunics. Surplus was again not a necessity. You got enough, don't you? Tell to my kids every Christmas. You don't like the other toys I got you? Why do you need more? Tell it to myself. I don't need that. I have enough. You have plenty. These disciples, they had plenty. How do they know they had plenty? They know the Lord. And the Lord said, you'll be taken care of. You want to know how they displayed their faith? They started to walk. They didn't pick up their staff. They didn't put a couple extra coins in their pocket when nobody was looking. They went. They went. Our faith must not be simply empty words. Your faith is going to be tried and tested and built up through pain, through suffering. All but for a little while. Because it was already mentioned today. There will be a day that we will be with Him. Do not be perplexed.
or at a loss of words. On that day, on that day, do not be at a loss of words when God says, why should I let you into my kingdom? Don't be at a loss of words then. I wholeheartedly plan, and let me tell you how my plans work out, I wholeheartedly plan on that day. If I am able to even mutter anything through my tears of joy, when he says, why should I let you into my kingdom? I would respond, you shouldn't. (laughs) You shouldn't. Nothing that I understand about Tim would point to the fact that you ought to love me. And that you ought to let me in here that I deserve any of this. But everything you've told me about Jesus, everything you told me about him, and I know, God, that you are exactly who you say you are. Your word is truth, and I have been sanctified by your truth on this day. Don't look at me, Lord. Look at your son. Don't be at a loss of words on that day. But also don't be too full of words because there'll be many on that day that'll be just full of all the stuff that they've done to deserve to get to heaven didn't i do this in your name didn't i say this for your praise didn't we do this and do that and raise this money and do that thing and the carpet's the right color at least and da 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 and dee 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 look at me don't look at me i'm not good I know me, and you know more about me. And despite every reason I've ever given you to not love me, you ignored my thoughts. I don't need to understand everything. You don't need to understand everything. Your father's working, and he worked on the cross, and he worked so that you would know him. Don't be perplexed. How do we know that they believed they went Verse 4, whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. This was a custom in verse 5, a custom that this is how we know that they were also going into Gentile houses. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. This was a practice if somebody was not welcomed in a Gentile home, if they were Jews. Shaking off the dust of your feet as a testimony against them. This is not a testimony of hate. This is a testimony against the fact that they're not being hospitable. Therefore, what would be an indicator in their life? If they do not welcome the stranger, if they do not welcome the one who comes in the name of the Lord, it is not a testimony of hate against them. It's a testimony of God. One, that he told them that this was going to happen. And two, they can tell the brothers this house is not they're not welcoming us. And I'd be hard pressed to believe that there'd be any punishment from the apostles to them. I would be willing to believe and I do believe that they would mark that house to be prayed over. How many times were you shared the gospel before you finally got it? I can't even count the number of times. I'm glad that when I was not receiving to hearing anything from people telling me about Christ, that they didn't dust their feet off and leave me. Because Christ did not leave me. And they departed and went through the villages preaching the gospel and healing only in places that they were comfortable. Healing everywhere. Go therefore into all the nations, preaching, teaching, loving, sharing, building up, being hospitable, sharing the gospel. Share your pains. There is an amazing benefit, my brothers and sisters, to bear one another's burdens. We need to share that more. Now Herod is perplexed as well. In verse 7, Now Herod the Tetrarch, this is Herod Antipas, this is uh, the son of Herod the Great, heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed. He was without words. 
because it was said by some that John, the Baptist, had been raised from the dead. Oh boy, that would be something. In Matthew 14, we read of John the Baptist's death. In that John the Baptist died by telling someone the truth. Matthew 14, 1 through 13 says this. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch, hey, it's the same guy, heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. This is why these miraculous powers are in work with him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had been saying to him, Herod, it is not lawful for you to have her. It is not lawful nor good for you to have your sister's wife. Knock it off, essentially. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him up to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. That's a weird gift. And he went through with it. He made an oath. He told her, I'd do anything you ask me. And so he killed John the Baptist. And now here he is, hearing about all these miracles and stuff, hearing all these healings and hearing all this stuff. And he's like, has John came back from the dead? Which is confusing for me, because what miracles did John the Baptist do? John the Baptist didn't do any miracles. He proclaimed the word of God. He was the forerunner for Jesus. He didn't do any miracles. He didn't do any healing touches. He didn't. John the Baptist did what we ought to do. Let's talk about the Lord. Talk about the kingdom of God. He was killed for it. And that was a difficult time for Jesus. Verse 13 from Matthew 14, 13. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. Well, why didn't Jesus just go back to John the Baptist and put him back together and heal him? Because there was a point to his death. There's a point to everything. There's nothing outside of his control. And yet it still grieved Jesus, so he went to a desolate place. He's wept. He wept over the death of Lazarus. Yes, in that, he knew that he was going to raise him from the dead. He's not unfamiliar with pain. He's not unfamiliar with pain that has a purpose. He suffered pain on the cross, did he not? For a purpose. You suffer pain right now. Whatever you got going on, whether it's physical, whether it's mental, whether it's spiritual, it is meant for the greater good that is drawing you closer to him. Who in here wants to just get ready and sign right up for pain? It's not easy. But again, we're trusting that we don't understand all of the ins and outs. We understand, we must, that he is faithful. We need to focus on him. Herod continues, And by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen, Herod said, John, I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. He didn't seek to see him so he could worship him. He wanted to see if he was in trouble. John the Baptist comes back, oh, he's probably going to come after Herod. He was thinking about himself when he sought the Christ. When he was before, when Jesus Christ was before Herod in Luke 23, which we'll get there eventually, Christ remained silent. Like, well, do a miracle or something. Nothing. Are you the Son of God? Nothing. Why? Christ doesn't answer to man. We've got instances in the scriptures where people have asked questions of God. Job, he questioned God. And God's response is, Brace yourself like a man, for I'm going to question you, and you're going to make it known to me. Were you there when I named the stars? 
Can you imagine the audacity? The audacity. I was just recently listening to a sermon of Paul Washer where he explains this audacity of humankind asking Christ or asking God to do the whole puppet and dance thing. And when he doesn't, then, well, I'm going to take over the show. I'm going to live my own life. I'm going to be me. Can you imagine? If you're an owner of a business, somebody coming in day one, they're a temp even. Nothing wrong about being a temp. I'm just using it as an analogy. They come in and they say, yeah, I know you've been doing this for like 30, 30, 40, 50 years or whatever, but uh, nah, we're going we're gonna to do something completely different. By the way, you're fired. <laughs> What? What does this young buck think he's doing? What is this guy? What? 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 Do you, you can't just do that. You don't know anything about this business. You don't know. You don't know what you're doing. What would you be your response? I'm thankful that God doesn't have the human response that we have. Because when we question Him and we say, "God, what are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? This hurts. I don't like this. Me, me, me. I, 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 I." When you ask him a question, why are you asking it? Because we also have Gideon who asked the question of God. And he said, prove it, God. Make this wool wet and the ground dry. Then I'll believe in you. And he did it. Why? Well, Zechariah also asked a question regarding the birth announcements of John the Baptist. But his question came with a little bit of a laugh and a chuckle. Like, <laughs> I'm old, how are you going to do? There's a difference between asking him a question and questioning him. The disciples, I believe, would have a question about why I'm not allowed to bring all this stuff on this missionary journey. But ultimately, they responded with trust. Why? Faith comes by hearing. The word of God himself just said we'd be taken care of. I'm going to trust that. Let's get to walking. Or the questioning of Jesus. Who are you? Why are you here? What can you do for me? And if you don't, then we're, we're, we're done. Prove yourself to me. That was Herod's position. What position do you take this morning? Because the position you take this morning reflects entirely on eternity. The position you take is prove, prove it to me, God. And then I'll let you know what I decide. Okay? He may. But at that point, it's going to be too late. Or if you're in the position of why am I going through this right now? Lord, Help me. Help me. Not necessarily get over this pain. I would love to get over this pain. But Paul had a thorn in the flesh as well. He said, Lord, take this from me. This is uncomfortable. I don't like this. Please. Questioning God. Please take this away from me. No. My grace is sufficient for you. My staff will hold you up. I will clothe you. I will feed you. I will provide for you more than treasures and riches of this earth. I will provide my son. You ever hear a dad talk to their kid after they just get done wrecking a bike or getting a splinter and they take the one look it up and say, hey, you're fine. Because <laughs> the father's been through it. He knows. So in the hardest parts of your life, Compare it to the cross. Hardest pains that you've gone, gone through. Compare it to the cross. So as Tim is laying on his back and saying, Oh, it's cramping again. You hear the Lord lovingly say, You're fine. Because he has me. He had the disciples. He even knew what to do with Herod and what was going to occur from that. Hindsight bias, he foreordained all things to work out for his good and his glory. 
Do not be at a loss of words on that day when he asks you, why should I let you into my kingdom? And if you know him on this day, whatever you're going through or walking to, display your faith by action. Take the next step. If the next step is you kneeling in prayer, do that. If the next step is you repenting, do that. The next step is reaching out to a brother or sister or a stranger or somebody that you've hurt and you want to reconcile. Do that. The first step starts with Jesus Christ. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. And what makes us think that he doesn't care about everything in between? He has brought you to life. He will bring you all the way through. Do not be at a loss of words. Don't be perplexed about this. Jesus Christ is for you. He's going to work through you and any trial you may face, that you stand and rest on him and his righteousness. So the Father looks down on all of us and he knows all things. And with a hearty father laugh, he says, you're fine. I'm going to take care of you. Trust him. You don't have to know everything that's going on right now in your life. You've got to know that he is in control of all things. Trust him and take the next step. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, help us trust you more. Help us take the next step. As we head out in our day-to-day, Help us know more and more that you are our provider. You're our redeemer. You have been faithful in all the days of our lives to bring us all here today as brothers and sisters and this little patch of grass in between Sturgis and Centerville to worship your holy and mighty name and to reflect on the sacrifice of your son so that we may be alive And there's more than just being alive. We ought to be living. We ought to be making the steps, talking to people, being hospitable, being a people who you've called us to be. The people that you've called us to be are less of us and more of you. We need your help and we ask that today. Not out of a questioning of what you're doing, but out of thankfulness of what you've already done. May nobody here be at a loss of words regarding your son. And you get all the praise and glory for all things. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And as the worship team comes up here, I would just like to say from my family to my family, thank you. Thank you for everything. The, the, the body as we have seen it, Anything from bringing over a pizza to helping repair the shower to just coming over and talking with me and making sure our needs are met. I cannot thank you enough. I'm thankful and blessed to see the body working as the hands and feet of Christ. And again, if anybody is going through anything and if anybody needs help with anything, I know it's hard. I know it's hard. Ask. Seek and you will find. Ask, bring it to light. There are many people here that would love to help and serve you as they're serving their king. So as we close, let us all stand together and sing our closing song, which is I Stand Amazed. I Stand Amazed. Did you do that on purpose? Stand? Me? Yeah. You did it. Okay. (laughs) I Stand Amazed. I'm glad to be, I'm amazed I'm standing right now. (laughs) Praise the Lord.
asked it in the beginning, I'll ask it now. Are, are they singing? Are we all singing about the same God? Are you singing about your Savior this morning? I hope you have a new song in your heart, and I hope you leave here today not at a loss for words. If you leave here today at a loss for words, may it be a loss of words of your thankfulness and gratefulness for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Don't rush on out of here. You've got plenty of life to do with one another. Say hi to somebody you haven't met. Share praise, share a testimony, because all the testimonies belong to him. God is good all the time and all the time. Make sense? Make sense. Yeah, I missed you. Grace and peace, who are dismissed.